The Man-Eating Leopard of Rudraprayang, Episode 4, Epoch 18 Touch and Go. News that is of importance to every individual travels fast, and during the past 10 days everyone in Garwal had heard of the poisoning of the man-eater, and of our hope that we had sealed it up in a cave. It was natural therefore for risks to have been taken, and quite evidently the leopard, having recovered from the effects of the poison and found a way out of the cave, had found the first person who was taking a risk. We had the day before us, for I had returned early from my visit to the cave, and after breakfast, mounted on Ibbotson's sure-footed horses and carrying our rifles, we set out for the village where the woman was reported to have been killed. After a fast ride up the pilgrim road we took a track that went diagonally across the hill, and a mile along this track, where the path from the village joined it, there were signs of a struggle and a big pool of blood. The headman, and relatives of the victim, were waiting for us at the village, and they showed us where the leopard had seized the woman as she was in the act of closing the door of her house behind her. From this point the leopard had dragged the woman along on her back for a hundred yards to the junction of the tracks, where he had released his hold, and after a violent struggle had killed her. The people in the village had heard the woman's screams as she was being dragged along the ground and as she was struggling for her life with the leopard, but had been too frightened to render any help. When the woman was dead, the leopard had picked her up and carried her over some wasteland, across an open ravine a hundred yards wide, and up the hill on the far side for another two hundred yards. There were no drag marks, but the blood trail was easy to follow, and it led us to a flat bit of ground, four feet wide and twenty feet long. On the upper side of this narrow strip of ground there was a perpendicular bank eight feet high with a stunted medlar tree growing on it, and on the lower side of the narrow strip the hill fell steeply away, and growing on it was a wild rose bush, which had reached up and smothered the medlar tree. Lying huddled up between the steep bank and the rose bush, with her head against the bank, with every vestige of clothing stripped from her, and with her naked body flecked with white rose petals that had fallen from above was the kill, an old grey-haired lady, seventy years of age. For this pitiful kill leopard would have to pay with his life, and after a short council of war, Ibbotson, leading the spare horse, returned to Rudraprayag for the things we needed, while I set off with my rifle to see whether it was possible to make contact with the man-eater in daylight. This part of the country was new to me, and the first thing to do was to reconnoiter the ground. I had already noted while at the village that the hill went steeply up from the ravine to a height of four to five thousand feet, that about two thousand feet of the top of the hill was clothed with dense oak and pine forest, below which was an open stretch of short grass about half a mile wide, and that below the grass was scrub jungle. Keeping now to the edge of the grass and scrub jungle I went round the shoulder of the hill, and found in front of me a wide depression, extending for half a mile down to the pilgrim road, and evidently caused in the days of long ago by a landslide. Beyond this depression, which was about a hundred yards wide at the upper end and about three hundred yards wide where it met the road, the ground was open. The ground in the depression was damp, and growing on this damp ground were a number or big trees, and under the tree a dense growth of scrub jungle. At the upper end of the depression was a cliff of overhanging rock, varying in height from 20 to 40 feet, and about a hundred yards long. Halfway along the cliff was a deep cleft a few feet wide, down which a tiny stream was trickling. Above the rocks was a narrow belt of scrub jungle, and above that again, open grassland. I had reconnoitred the ground with care, for I did not want the leopard, which I was convinced was lying up in the depression, to be aware of my presence before it suited me. It was now necessary to find approximately where the leopard was most likely to be lying up, and to gain this information I went back to the kill. We had been told in the village that it had got light shortly after the woman had been killed, and as it must have taken the leopard some little time to effect the kill, carry his victim 400 yards, and eat a portion of it, it was reasonable to assume that he had left the spot where he had hidden the kill when day was fully established. The hill on which the kill was lying was in full view of the village, in which at this hour there must have been considerable movement. The leopard therefore on leaving the kill would very naturally had kept to cover as far as was possible, and working on this assumption, and also because the ground was too hard to show pug marks, I set out to follow him along the line I assumed he had taken. When I had covered half a mile and was out of view of the village and was approaching the depression, I was gratified to find that I had followed on the leopard's tracks foot by foot, for in the lee of a bush where there was some loose earth, I found where he had been lying for several hours. His pug marks when leaving this spot showed that he had entered the depression about 50 yards below the cliff of rock. 
For half an hour I lay where the leopard had lain, watching the small area of tree and scrub jungle in front of me in the hope that the leopard would make some slight movement and give away his position. After I had been watching for a few minutes a movement among the dead leaves attracted my attention, and presently two scimitar babblers came into view industriously turning over the leaves, looking for grubs. Where carnivores are concerned, these birds are among the most reliable informants in the jungle, and I hoped later to make use of this pair to help in locating the leopard. No movement had been visible and no sound had come to indicate that the leopard was in the depression, but that he was there I was still convinced, and having failed to get a shot in one way I decided to try another way. Without coming out into the open, there were two natural lines of retreat for the leopard, one down the hill towards the pilgrim road, and the other up the hill. To move him down the hill would not profit me, but if I moved him up the hill he would for a certainty go up the cleft in the rock cliff to gain the shelter of the bushes above the cliff, and while he was doing so, there was a reasonable chance of my getting a shot. Entering the depression a little below where I thought the leopard was, I started to zigzag very slowly across it, gaining a few feet in height at each turn. There was as yet no need for me to keep an eye on the cleft, for the babblers were on the ground a few feet below it, and they would let me know when the leopard was on the move. I had gained about 40 yards in height in my movements forward and backwards across the depression and was about 10 yards from, and a little to the left of the cleft, when the babblers rose in alarm and, flying into a small oak tree and hopping about excitedly on the branches, started to give the clear and ringing alarm call, which can in the hills be heard for a distance of half a mile. Holding the rifle ready to take a snapshot, I stood perfectly still for a minute, and then started slowly moving forward. The ground here was wet and slippery and, with my eyes fixed on the cleft, I had only taken two steps when my rubber-soled shoes slipped on the wet surface, and while I was endeavouring to regain my balance, the leopard sprang up the cleft, and in the bushes above put up a covey of Kalege pheasants, which came sailing down over my head. My second attempt had failed, and though it would have been quite easy for me to have moved the leopard back to where he had started from, it would have been of no use for me to do so for, from above, the cleft in the rock was not visible until one was right up to it, and long before I gained the position the leopard would have been far down the depression. Ibbotson and I had arranged to meet in the open ravine at 2 p.m., and a little before that hour he returned from Rudraprayag, accompanied by several men carrying the things he had gone to fetch. These consisted of food, and drink, in the way of tea, our old friend the Petromax lamp, which on this occasion I decided I would carry myself, if the necessity arose, two spare rifles and ammunition, my fishing reel, a liberal supply of cyanide, and the gin trap. Sitting in the ravine by a clear stream of water, we had our lunch and brewed ourselves cups of tea, and then went over to the kill. I will give a description of the position of the kill, to enable you to follow our movements and the subsequent happenings. The kill was lying about five feet from the near or ravine end of the flat strip of ground, which was four feet wide and about twenty feet long. The upper side of this strip of ground was protected by a high bank, and the lower side by a steep drop and a spreading rose bush. The stunted medlar tree on the bank was too small to allow a macken being made in it, so we decided to depend entirely on a gun trap, poison, and the gun trap. Having come to this decision we set about our preparations. First we poisoned the kill, of which the leopard had, for want of time, only eaten a small portion hoping that on this occasion he would only consume sufficient to poison himself effectively. Then, while I bent over the kill in the position we anticipated the leopard would assume when eating, Ibbotson sighted and securely lashed his 256 manager, which had a hair trigger, and my 450 high-velocity rifle to two saplings, 15 yards on our approach side of the kill. There were no insuperable obstacles to the leopard getting at the kill from any side he might wish to, but his most natural line of approach from where I had left him was along the 15 feet or so of flat ground, and on this strip of flat ground we proceeded to bury the huge gin trap, first removing from the ground every dead leaf, bit of stick, and blade of grass that were lying on it. After we had dug a hole sufficiently long, wide, and deep, removing the displaced earth to a distance, we put the gun trap in it, and when the powerful springs that closed the jaws had been depressed, and the plate that constituted the trigger adjusted as delicately as we dared set it, we covered the whole trap with a layer of green leaves, over which we sprinkled earth, and blades of grass in the position we had found them. So carefully had the trap been set in the ground that we who had set it found it difficult to determine its exact position. 
My fishing reel was now produced and one end of the dressed silk line was tied to the trigger of one rifle, looped round the butt end, and taken to within 10 feet of the kill, from where it was taken back, looped round the butt end of the second rifle, and tied to the trigger. The line was then cut, much to my regret, for it was a new and very good line, and after the end had been tied round the woman's waist, the line was passed through the loop, the lines to the triggers pulled taut, and a secure knot was tied. The line was then cut for the second time. As we cast a final look over our handiwork, which appeared very good to us, it struck us that if the leopard was to wander round and approach the kill from our side, and not from the side we expected him to come, he might avoid both the guns and the gin trap, and to prevent his doing so we sent to the village for a crowbar, while we cut five thorn bushes from some little distance away. With the crowbar we made five holes a foot deep, on our side of the flat strip of ground, and into these holes we planted the bushes, stamping the earth round them and making them almost as secure and quite as natural to look at as when they were growing on the hillside. We were now quite satisfied that no animal bigger than a rat could approach the kill and eat any portion of it without meeting death in one form of another, so throwing off the safety catches of the rifles, we returned to the village. Fifty yards from the village, and close to where we had on our arrival found the pool of blood, there was a big wide spreading mango tree. In this tree we made a macken from planks procured from the village, and on it we piled a lot of sweet-smelling rice straw, for it was our intention to spend the night on it, in anticipation of having to finish off the leopard if he was caught in the gin trap. Near sundown we took our position on the macken, which was long enough for us to lie on at length and wide enough for us to lie side by side. The distance from the macken to the kill across the ravine was 200 yards, and the kill was on a higher level than the macken by about 100 feet. Ibbotson feared that his aim with the telescopic sight fitted to his rifle would not be quite accurate, so while he took a pair of powerful field glasses from their case, I loaded my 275 rifle. Our plan was that while Ibbotson concentrated on the portion of the hill along which we expected the leopard to come, I would keep a general lookout all over the hill, and if we saw the leopard, I would risk taking a shot, even if the shot had to be taken at the extreme range to which my rifle was sighted, which was 300 yards. While Ibbotson dozed, I smoked and watched the shadows cast by the hills in the west slowly creep up the hill in front of us, and when the rays from the setting sun were gilding the crest of the hill red, Ibbotson awoke and picked up his field glasses, and I picked up my rife, for the time had now come when we could expect the leopard to make his appearance. There was still some forty live minutes of daylight left, and during the time we intently scanned, I with a pair of eyes that few are blessed with, and Ibbotson with his field glasses, every foot of the considerable expanse of hill visible from our macken, without seeing the movement of a bird or animal. When there was no longer sufficient light to shoot by, I put down my rifle, and a little later Ibbotson returned his field glasses to their case. One chance of killing the leopard had gone, but there were still three chances left, so we were not unduly depressed. Shortly after dark it came on to rain, and I whispered to Ibbotson that I feared it would prove our undoing, for if the additional weight of rainwater on the delicately set gin trap did not set it off, the contracting of the fishing line due to getting wet, no matter how slight it might be, would to a certainty fire off his hair trigger rifle. Some time later, and while it was still raining, Ibbotson asked me what time it was. I had a luminous wristwatch, and I had just told him it was a quarter to eight when a succession of savage and angry roars came from the direction of the kill, the leopard, the much famed man-eating leopard of Rudraprayag, was at long last in the gin trap. Ibbotson took a flying leap from the macken while I swung down from a branch, and that neither of us broke limbs in the descent can only be attributed to luck. The Petromax lamp hidden in a nearby yam field was found, and while Ibbotson proceeded to light it, I gave expression to my fears and doubts, and admit I deserved Ibbotson's rejoinder, you are a rotten pessimist. First you think a few drops of rain are going to spring the trap and fire off my rifle, and now you think because the leopard is not making a noise that it has got out of the trap. That was just what I was thinking, and fearing, for on that other occasion when we had trapped a leopard it had roared and growled continuously, whereas this one, after that one expression of rage which had brought us rumbling out of the macken, had been ominously silent. Ibbotson is an expert with all makes of lamps and in a very short time he had the Petromax lit and pumped up, and throwing our doubts to the winds, for even Ibbotson was by now beginning to suspect the silence, we set off over the rough ground as hard as we could go, circling wide to avoid the fishing lines and a possible angry leopard, and approached the kill from above. 
When we got to the high bank and looked down we saw the hole in the ground, but no gin trap. Just as our hopes were bounding up, the brilliant light of the Petromax revealed the trap, with its jaws closed and empty, 10 yards down the hillside. The kill was no longer lying with its head against the bank, and a glance revealed that a considerable portion of it had been eaten. Our thoughts were too bitter to give expression to as we went back to the mango tree and climbed into the Macan. There was no longer any need for us to keep awake, so heaping some of the straw over ourselves, for we had no bedding and the night was cold, we went to sleep. At the first streak of dawn a fire was built near the mango tree and water heated, and after we had drunk several cups of tea and warmed ourselves at the fire, we set off for the kill, accompanied by the patuari and several of Ibbotson's and my men, together with a number of men from the village. I mention the fact that there were two of us, and that we had the patuari and a number of men with us, for had I been alone I would have hesitated to relate what I am now going to tell you. Fiend or animal, had the slayer of the old woman been present and watched our overnight preparations it would even then have been difficult to understand how it had, on a dark and rainy night, avoided capture or death in one form or another. The rain, though light, had been sufficient to soften the ground, and we were able to reconstruct and to follow his every movement of the previous night. The leopard had come from the direction from which we had expected him to come, and on arrival at the flat strip of ground, had skirted round and below it, and had then approached the kill from the side where we had firmly planted the thorn bushes. Three of these bushes he had pulled up, making a sufficiently wide gap to go through, and then, getting hold of the kill, he had drawn it a foot or so towards the rifles, thus slackening off the fishing lines. Having done this he had started to eat, avoiding while doing so contact with the fishing line that was tied round the woman's body. We had not thought it necessary to poison either the head or the neck. These he had eaten first, and then, very carefully, he had eaten all the portion of the body between the many doses of poison we had inserted in different places. After satisfying his hunger, the leopard left the kill with the intention of seeking shelter from the rain and, while he was doing so, what I feared would happen actually happened. The weight of rainwater on the very finely set trap had depressed the plate that constituted the trigger, and released the springs just as the leopard was stepping over the trap, and the great jaws had met on either side of the stifle, or knee joint, of his hind leg. And here was the greatest tragedy of all, for when bringing the trap up from Rudraprayag, the men carrying it had let it fall, and one of the three inch long teeth had been broken off, and the stifle of the leopard's left hind leg had been caught by the jaws exactly where this missing tooth formed a gap in the otherwise perfectly fitting set of teeth. But for this missing tooth the leopard would have been fixed to the trap without any possibility of getting free, for the grip on his leg had been sufficiently good for him to lift the 80 pound trap out of the hole in which we had buried it, and carry it 10 yards down the hillside. And now, instead of the leopard, the jaws of the trap only held a tuft of hair and a small piece of skin, which we later, much later, had the great satisfaction of fitting back into position. However unbelievable the actions of the leopard may appear to have been, they were in fact just what one would have expected from an animal that had been a man-eater for eight years. Avoiding the open ground, and approaching the kill under cover, removing the thorn obstruction we bad erected across the blood trail he had left that morning, pulling the kill towards him into a convenient position for his meal, and rejecting those portions of the kill that we had poisoned, cyanide, of which he now had experience, has a very strong smell, were all quite normal and natural actions. The explanation I have given for the springing of the trap is, I am convinced, correct. It was just a coincidence that the leopard happened to be directly over the trap the very moment that the additional weight of water set it off. Having dismantled the gin trap, and waited until the relatives had removed what remained of the old woman for cremation, we set out to walk back to Rudraprayag, leaving our men to follow us. Sometime during the night the leopard had come to the mango tree, for we found his pug marks near the tree where the pool of blood, now washed away by the rain, had been, and we followed these pug marks down the track to the pilgrim road and four miles along the road to the gate of the inspection bungalow where, after scratching up the ground at the base of one of the pillars of the gate, he had gone on down the road for another mile to where my old friend the packman was camped, one of whose goats he had wantonly killed. I need not tell those of you who have carried a sporting rifle in any part of the world that all these many repeated failures and disappointments, so far from discouraging me, only strengthened my determination to carry on until that great day or night came when, having discarded poisons and traps, I would get an opportunity of using my rifle as rifles were intended to be used 
to put a bullet truly and accurately into the man-eater's body. Epoch 19 A Lesson in Caution I have never agreed with those sportsmen who attribute all their failures in big game hunting to their being Jonas. The thoughts of a sportsman, whether they be pessimistic or whether they be optimistic, sitting waiting for an animal, cannot in any conceivable way influence the actions of the animal he is endeavoring to shoot or, maybe, to photograph. We are apt to forget that the hearing and sight of wild animals, and especially of those animals that depend exclusively on these senses not only for food, but also for self-preservation, are on a plane far and away above that of civilized human beings, and that there is no justification for us to assume that because we cannot hear or see the movements of our prospective quarry, our quarry cannot hear or see our movements. A wrong estimation of the intelligence of animals, and the inability to sit without making any sound or movement for the required length of time, is the cause of all failures when sitting up for animals. As an example of the acute sense of hearing of carnivores, and the care it is necessary to exercise when contact with one of them is desired, I will relate one of my recent experiences. On a day in March, when the carpet of dry leaves on the ground recorded the falling of every dead leaf and the movements of the smallest of the birds that feed on the ground, I located in some very heavy undergrowth the exact position of a tiger I had long wished to photograph, by moving a troop of lung lures in the direction in which I suspected the tiger to be lying up. 70 yards from the tiger there was an open glade, 50 yards long and 30 yards wide. On the edge of the glade, away from the tiger, there was a big tree overgrown with creepers that extended right up to the topmost branches, 20 feet from the ground the tree forked in two. I knew that the tiger would cross the glade in the late afternoon, for the glade lay directly between him and his sambar kill which I had found early that morning. There was no suitable cover near the kill for the tiger to lie up in during the day, so he had gone to the heavy undergrowth where the lungoas had located him for me. It is often necessary, when shooting or photographing tigers and leopards on foot, to know the exact position of one's quarry, whether it be a wounded animal that one desires to put out of its misery or an animal that one wants to photograph, and the best way of doing this is by enlisting the help of birds or animals. With patience, and with a knowledge of the habit of the bird or animal the sportsman desires to use, it is not difficult to get a particular bird or animal to go in the required direction. The birds most suitable for this purpose are red jungle fowl, peafowl, and white-capped babblers, and of animals the most suitable are cacas and lungoas. The tiger I am telling you about was unwounded and it would have been quite easy for me to go into the undergrowth and find him myself, but in doing so I should have disturbed him and defeated my own purposes, whereas by using the troop of lungoas and knowing what their reactions would be on sighting the tiger, if he happened to be in the undergrowth, I was able to get the information I wanted without disturbing the tiger. Very carefully I stalked the tree I have referred to, and avoiding contact with the creepers, the upper tendrils and leaves of which might have been visible from where the tiger was lying, I climbed to the fork, where I had a comfortable seat and perfect concealment. Getting out my 16mm Cine camera I made an opening to the screen of leaves in front of me just big enough to photograph through, and having accomplished all this without having made a sound, I sat still. My field of vision was confined to the glade and to the jungle immediately beyond it. After I had been sitting for an hour, a pair of bronze-winged doves rose out of the jungle and went skimming over the low brushwood, and a minute or two later, and a little closer to me, a small flight of upland pipits rose off the ground and, after daintily tripping along the branches of a leafless tree, rose above the tree tops and went off. Neither of these two species of birds has any alarm call, but I knew from their behavior that the tiger was afoot and that they had been disturbed by him. Minutes later I was slowly turning my eyes from left to right scanning every foot of ground visible to me, when my eyes came to rest on a small white object, possibly an inch or two square, immediately in front of me, and about ten feet from the edge of the glade. Focusing my eyes on this stationary object for a little while, I then continued to scan the bushes to the limit of my field of vision to the right, and then back again to the white object. I was now convinced that this object had not been where it was for more than a minute or two before I had first caught sight of it, and that it could not be anything other than a white mark on the tiger's face. Quite evidently the tiger had heard me when I was approaching or climbing the tree, though I had done this in thin rubber shoes without making as far as I was aware any sound, and when the time had come for him to go to his kill he had stalked, for a distance of 70 yards over dry leaves, the spot he had pinpointed as the source of some suspicious sound. After lying for half an hour without making any movement, he stood up, stretched himself, yawned, 
and, satisfied that he had nothing to fear, walked out into the glade. Here he stood, turning his head first to the right and then to the left, and then crossed the glade, passing right under my tree on his way to his kill. When in my wanderings through the jungles, I see the makans that have been put up for the purpose of shooting carnivores, and note the saplings that have been felled nearby to make the platform, the branches that have been cut to give a clear view, and see the litter and debris left lying about, and consider the talking and noise that must have accompanied these operations, I am not surprised when I hear people say they have sat up hundreds of times for tigers and leopards without ever having seen one of these animals, and attribute their failures to their being Jonah's. Our failure to bag the man-eater up to that date was not due to our having done anything we should not have done, or left undone anything we should have done. It could only be attributed to sheer bad luck. Bad luck that had prevented my receiving the electric light in time, that had given Ibbotson cramps in both legs, that had made the leopard eat an overdose of cyanide, and, finally, that had made the men drop the gun trap and break the one tooth that mattered. So when Ibbotson returned to Powery, after our failure to kill the leopard over the body of his 70-year-old victim, I was full of hope, for I considered my chance of shooting the leopard as good as they were on the first day I arrived at Rudraprayag, and in fact better than they had then been, for I now knew the capabilities of the animal I had to deal with. One thing was causing me a lot of uneasiness and much heart-searching, and that was confining the man-eater to one bank of the river. However, I looked at it, it did not appear to be right that the people on the left bank of the Alignander should be exposed to attacks by the leopard, while the people on the right bank were free from the risk of such attacks. Including the boy killed two days before our arrival, three people had recently lost their lives on the left bank, and others might meet with a like fate, and yet to open the two bridges and let the leopard cross over to the right bank would add an hundredfold to my difficulties, which were already considerable, and would not benefit Garwal as a whole for the lives of the people on the right bank of the river were just as valuable as the lives of the people on the left bank, so. Very reluctantly, I decided to keep the bridges closed. And here I should like to pay my tribute to the people, numbering many thousands, living on the left bank of the river who, knowing that the closing of the bridges was confining the activities of the dread man-eater to their area, never once, during the months I closed the bridges, removed the barriers themselves, or asked me to do so. Having decided to keep the bridges closed, I sent a man to warn the villagers of the danger, and myself carried the warning to as many villagers as time and my ability to walk permitted of my doing. No one whom I talked with on the roads and in the villages ever expressed one word of resentment at the leopard having been confined to their area, and everywhere I went I was offered hospitality and speeded on my way with blessings, and I was greatly encouraged by the assurances from both men and women, who did not know but what they might be the man-eater's next victim, that it was no matter for regret that the leopard had not died yesterday, for surely it would die today or, maybe, tomorrow. Epoch 20 A Wild Boar Hunt The old packman had arrived at the thorn enclosure late the previous evening. He was packing salt and gua from the bazaar at Hardwa to the villages beyond Badrinat, and as his flock of sheep and goats was heavily laden and the last march had been a long one, he had arrived too late at the thorn enclosure to repair the weak places in it, with the result that several of the goats had strayed out of the enclosure and one of them the leopard had killed, close to the road, during the early hours of the morning. The barking of his dogs had awakened him, and when it got light, he saw his best goat, a beautiful steel-grey animal nearly as large as a Shetland pony, lying dead near the road, wantonly killed by the man-eater. The behavior of the man-eater during the previous night showed the extent to which the habits of a leopard change when it has become a man-eater and has lived in close association with human beings over a long period of years. It was reasonable to assume that the man-eater had received a great shock, and a great fright, by being caught in the gin trap. His having carried the heavy trap for ten yards and the angry way in which he had roared were in fact proof of this, and one would have expected him, the moment he got out of the trap, to have retired to some secluded spot as far removed from human habitation as possible, and to have remained there until he was again hungry, which he would not be for several days. But, so far from doing this, he had quite evidently remained in the vicinity of the kill, and after watching us climb into the Macken and giving us time to go to sleep, had come to investigate. Fortunately for us, Ibbotson had taken the precaution to protect the Macken by putting wire netting all round it, for it is not an unheard of thing for man-eating leopards to kill people who are sitting up trying to shoot them. At the present time there is a man-eating leopard in the central provinces that has, at different times, killed and eaten four Indian sportsmen who were trying to shoot him, 
Up to the time I last heard of this animal he had killed 40 human beings, and owing to his habit of eating his would-be slayers, he was living a very peaceful and undisturbed life, varying his human diet with game and domestic animals. After his visit to the mango tree, our man-eater went along the village path to its junction with the track. Here, where we had found the pool of blood, he had turned to the right and gone down the track for a mile, and then along the pilgrim road for another four miles and into the most densely populated part of the area in which he was operating. On arrival at Rudraprayag, he had gone through the main street of the bazaar, and half a mile farther on had scratched up the ground at the gate of the inspection bungalow. The rain of the previous night had softened the clay surface of the road, and on the soft clay the pug marks of the leopard showed up clearly, and from them it was possible to see that the leopard's encounter with the gun trap had not resulted in injury to any of his limbs. After breakfast I took up the tracks at the gate and followed him to the packman's camp. From a bend in the road, a hundred yards from the camp, the leopard had caught sight of the goats that had strayed from the enclosure, and crossing from the outer to the inner edge of the road and creeping along under shelter of the hill he had stalked the grazing animals and, after killing the steel grey goat but without even troubling to drink its blood, had returned to the road. In the thorn enclosure, guarding the dead goat and the neatly stacked pile of packs, were the packman's two sheepdogs, tethered to stout pegs with short lengths of heavy chain. These big, black, and powerful dogs that are used by packmen throughout our hills are not accredited sheepdogs in the same sense that sheepdogs in Great Britain and in Europe are. On the march the dogs keep close to heel, and their duties, which they perform very efficiently, start when camp is made. At night they guard the camp against wild animals, I have known two of them to kill a leopard, and during the day and while the packmen are away grazing the flock, they guard the camp against all intruders. A case is on record of one of these dogs having killed a man who was attempting to remove a pack from the camp it had been left to guard. I picked up the tracks of the leopard where he returned to the road after killing the goat, and followed them through Golabri and for a mile farther on, to where a deep ravine crosses the road, up which he had gone. The distance the leopard had covered from the mango tree to the ravine was about eight miles. This long and seemingly aimless walk away from a kill was in itself a thing no ordinary leopard would under any circumstances have undertaken, nor would an ordinary leopard have killed a goat when he was not hungry. A quarter of a mile beyond the ravine the old packman was sitting on a rock by the side of the road, spinning wool and watching his flock, which were grazing on the open hillside. When he had dropped his spinning stick and wool into the capacious pocket in his blanket robe and accepted a cigarette, he asked if I had come past his camp. When I told him I had done so and that I had seen what the evil spirit had done, and added that it would be wise to sell his dogs to camelmen on his next visit to Hardwa, for it was quite evident that they were lacking in courage, he nodded his head as one in agree with what he heard. Then he said, Sahib, even we old hands are apt at times to make mistakes, and suffer for them, even as I have this night suffered by losing my best goat. My dogs have the courage of tigers, and are the best dogs in all Garwal, and it is an insult to them for you to say they are only fit to be sold to camelmen. My camp as you doubtless observed, is very close to the road, and I feared that if by chance anyone came along the road by night, my dogs might do him an injury so I chained them up outside the thorn enclosure instead of leaving them loose, as is my want. You have seen the result, but do not blame the dogs, Sahib, for in their efforts to save my goat their collars have bitten deep into their necks, and made wounds that will take many days to heal. While we were talking, an animal appeared on the crest of the hill on the far side of the Ganges. From its color and size, I at first thought it was a Himalayan bear, but when it started to come down the hill towards the river, I saw it was a big wild boar. The pig was followed by a pack of village pie dogs, who in turn were followed by a rabble of boys and men, all armed with sticks of varying size. Last of all came a man carrying a gun. As this man crested the hill he raised his piece and we saw a puff of smoke, and a little later heard the dull report of a muzzle-loading gun. The only living things within range of the gun were the boys and men, but as none of them dropped out of the race, the sportsman appeared to have missed them. The pig had a long grassy slope before him, with an odd bush dotted here and there, and below the grass slope was some broken ground, and below that again a dense belt of brushwood which extended right down to the river. On the rough broken ground the pig lost his lead, and pig and pie dogs disappeared into the brushwood together. Next minute all the dogs, with the exception of the big light-colored animal that had been leading the pack, dashed back out of the brushwood. When the boys and men arrived they appeared to urge the dogs to re-enter the cover, 
But this, after apparently having recently seen what the pig could do with his tusks, they were unwilling to do. The man with the gun then arrived, and was immediately surrounded by the boys and men. To us sitting on our elevated grandstand with the river flowing between, the scene being enacted on the farther hill was a silent picture, for the noise of the water deadened sound and all we had heard was the dull report of the muzzle loader. The sportsman was apparently as reluctant to enter the cover as the dogs were, for presently he broke away from his companions and sat down on a rock, as if to say, I have done my bit, now you do yours. Confronted with this double dilemma, for the dogs, even after some of them had been beaten, stoutly refused to face the pig, first the boys and then the men started to throw stones into the brushwood. While this was going on, we saw the pig emerge from the lower end of the brushwood onto a narrow strip of sand. With a few quick steps he came out into the open, stood perfectly still for a few seconds, took a few more steps, stopped again, and then with a little run plunged into the river. Pigs, the wild variety, are exceptionally good swimmers, and they do not cut their throats with their hooves while swimming, as is generally believed. The current in the river was strong, but there is no bigger hearted animal than our wild pig, and when I last saw the old boar he had been washed down the river a quarter of a mile, but was swimming strongly and was nearing our bank, which I have no doubt he reached safely. Was the pig within range of your rifle, Sahib? asked the packman. Yes, I replied, the pig was within range but I have not brought a rifle to Garwal to shoot pigs that are running for their lives, but to shoot what you think is an evil spirit, and what I know is a leopard. Have it your own way, he rejoined, and now, as you are going, and we may never meet again, take my blessings with you, and time will prove whether you or I am right. I regret I never saw the packman again, for he was a grand old man, as proud as Lucifer, and as happy as the day was long, when leopards were not killing his best goats and when the courage of his dogs was not being questioned. Epoch 21 Vigil on a Pine Tree Ibbotson returned to Powery next day, and the following morning, when I was visiting the villages on the hill to the east of Rudraprayag, I found the tracks of the man-eater on a path leading out of a village in which the previous night he had tried to break open the door of a house in which there was a child suffering from a bad cough. On following the tracks for a couple of miles, they led me to the shoulder of the mountain where, some days previously, Ibbotson and I had sat up over the calling goat which the leopard had later killed. It was still quite early, and as there was a chance of finding the leopard basking on one of the rocks in this considerable area of broken ground, I lay on a projecting rock that commanded an extensive view. It had rained the previous evening, thus enabling me to track the leopard, and washed the haze out of the atmosphere. Visibility was at its best and the view from the projecting rock was as good as could be seen in any part of the world where mountains rise to a height of 23,000 feet. Immediately below me was the beautiful valley of the Alaknanda, with the river showing as a gleaming silver ribbon winding in and out of it. On the hill beyond the river, villages were dotted about, some with only a single thatched hut, and others with long rows of slate-roofed houses. These row buildings are in fact individual homesteads, built one against the other to save expense and to economize space, for the people are poor and every foot of workable land in Garwal is needed for agriculture. Beyond the hills were rugged rocks cliffs, down which avalanches roar in winter and early spring, and beyond and above the cliffs were the eternal snows, showing up against the intense blue sky as clear as if cut out of white cardboard. No more beautiful or peaceful scene could be imagined, and yet when the sun, now shining on the back of my head, set on the far side of the snow mountains, terror, terror which it is not possible to imagine until experienced, would grip, as it had done for eight long years, the area I was now overlooking. I had been lying on the rock for an hour when two men came down the hill, on their way to the bazaar. They were from a village about a mile farther up the hill that I had visited the previous day, and they informed me that a little before sunrise they had heard a leopard calling in this direction. We discussed the possibilities of my getting a shot at the leopard over a goat, and as at that time I had no goats of my own, they offered to bring me one from their village and promised to meet me where we were standing, two hours before sunset. When the men had gone I looked round for a place where I could sit. The only tree on the whole of this pale of the mountain was a solitary pine. It was growing on the ridge close to the path down which the men had come, and from under it a second path took off and ran across the face of the mountain skirting the upper edge of the broken ground, where I had recently been looking for the leopard. The tree commanded an extensive view, but it could be difficult to climb, and would afford little cover. However, as it was the only tree in the area, 
I had no choice, so decided I would try it. The men were waiting for me with a goat when I returned at about 4 pm, and when, in reply to their question where I intended sitting, I pointed to the pine, they started laughing. Without a rope ladder, they said, it would not be possible to climb the tree. And further, if I succeeded in climbing the tree without a ladder, and carried out my intention of remaining out all night, I should have no protection against the man-eater, to whom the tree would offer no obstacle. There were two white men in Garwal, Ibbotson was one of them, who had collected birds' eggs when boys, and both of whom could climb the tree, and as there is no exact equivalent in Hindustani for waiting until you come to a bridge before crossing it, I let the second part of the men's objection go unanswered, contenting myself by pointing to my rifle. The pine was not easy to climb, for there were no branches for 20 feet, but once having reached the lowest branch, the rest was easy. I had provided myself with a long length of cotton cord, and when the men had tied my rifle to one end of it, I drew it up and climbed to the top of the tree, where the pine needles afforded most cover. The men had assured me that the goat was a good caller, and after they tied it to an exposed root of the tree, they set off for their village promising to return early next morning. The goat watched the men out of sight, and then started to nibble the short grass at the foot of the tree. The fact that it had not up to then called once did not worry me, for I felt sure that it would presently feel lonely and that it would then do its share of the business of the evening, and if it did it while it was still night, from my elevated position I should be able to kill the leopard long before it got anywhere near the goat. When I climbed the tree, the shadows cast by the snow mountains had reached the Alexander. Slowly these shadows crept up the hill and passed me, until only the top of the mountain glowed with red light. As this glow faded, long streamers of light shot up from the snow mountains where the rays of the setting sun were caught and held on a bank of clouds as soft and as light as thistledown. Everyone who has eyes to see a sunset, and the number, as you might have observed, is regrettably few, thinks that the sunsets in his particular part of the world are the best ever. I am no exception, for I too think that there are no sunsets in all the world to compare with ours, and a good second are the sunsets in northern Tanganyika, where some quality in the atmosphere makes snow-capped Kilimanjaro, and the clouds that are invariably above it, glow like molten gold in the rays of the setting sun. Our sunsets in the Himalayas are mostly red, pink, or gold. The one I was looking at the evening from my seat on the pine tree was rose pink, and the white shafts of light, starting as spear points from valleys in the cardboard snows, shot through the pink clouds and, broadening, faded out in the sky overhead. The goat, like many human beings, had no interest in sunsets, and after nibbling the grass within reach, scratched a shallow hole for itself, lay down, curled up, and went to sleep. Here was a dilemma, I had counted on the animal now placidly sleeping below me to call up the leopard, and not once since I had first seen it had it opened its mouth, except to nibble grass, and now, having made itself comfortable, it would probably sleep throughout the night. To have left the tree at that hour in an attempt to return to the bungalow would have added one more to the number who deliberately commit suicide, and as I had to be doing something to kill the man-eater, and as, in the absence of a kill, one place was as good as another, I decided to stay where I was, and try to call up the leopard myself. If I were asked what had contributed most to my pleasure during all the years that I have spent in Indian jungles, I would unhesitatingly say that I had derived most pleasure from a knowledge of the language, and the habits, of the jungle folk. There is no universal language in the jungles. Each species has its own language, and though the vocabulary of some is limited, as in the case of porcupines and vultures, the language of each species is understood by all the jungle folk. The vocal cords of human beings are more adaptable than the vocal cords of any of the jungle folk, with the one exception of the crested wire-tailed drongo, and for this reason it is possible for human beings to hold commune with quite a big range of birds and animals. The ability to speak the language of the jungle folk, apart from adding hundredfold to one's pleasure in the jungle, can, if so desired, be put to great use. One example will suffice. Lionel Fortescue, up till recently a housemaster at Eton, and I were on a photographing and fishing tour in the Himalayas shortly after 1918, and we arrived one evening at a forest bungalow at the foot of a great mountain, on the far side of which was our objective, the Vale of Kashmir. We had been marching over hard ground for many days, and as the men carrying our luggage needed a rest, we decided to halt for a day at the bungalow. Next day, while Fortescue wrote up his notes, I set out to explore the mountain and try for a Kashmir stag. 
I had been informed by friends who had shot in Kashmir that it was not possible to shoot one of these stags without the help of an experienced shikari, and this was confirmed by the chokadar in charge of the forest bungalow. With the whole day before me I set out alone, after breakfast, without having the least idea at what elevation the red deer lived, or the kind of ground on which they were likely to be found. The mountain, over which there is a pass into Kashmir, is about 12,000 feet high, and after I had climbed to a height of 8,000 a storm came on. From the color of the clouds I knew I was in for a hailstorm, so I selected with care a tree under which to shelter. I have seen both human beings and animals killed by hail, and by the lightning that invariably accompanies hailstorms, so rejecting the big fir trees with tapering tops I selected a small tree with a rounded top and dense foliage, and collecting a supply of dead wood and fir cones, I built a fire, and for the hour that the thunder roared overhead and the hail lashed down, I sat at the foot of my tree safe and warm. The moment the hail stopped the sun came out, and from the shelter of the tree I stepped into fairyland, for the hail that carpeted the ground gave off a million points of light to which every glistening leaf and blade of grass added its quota. Continuing up for another two or three thousand feet, I came on an outcrop of rock, at the foot of which was a bed of blue mountain poppies. The stalks of many of these, the most beautiful of all wild flowers in the Himalayas, were broken, even so these sky-blue flowers standing in a bed of spotless white were a never-to-be-forgotten sight. The rocks were too slippery to climb, and there appeared to be no object in going to the top of the hill, so keeping to the contours I went to the left, and after half a mile through a forest of giant fir trees I came to a grassy slope which, starting from the top of the hill, extended several thousand feet down into the forest. As I came through the trees towards this grassy slope I saw on the far side of it an animal standing on a little knoll, with its tail towards me. From illustrations seen in game books I knew the animal was a red cashmere deer, and when it raised its head, I saw it was a hind. On my side of the grassy slope, and about 30 yards from the edge of the forest, there was a big isolated rock some 4 feet high, the distance between this rock and the knoll was about 40 yards. Moving only when the deer was cropping the grass, and remaining still each time she raised her head, I crept up to the shelter of the rock. The hind was quite obviously a sentinel, and from the way she looked to her right each time she raised her head, I knew she had companions, and the exact direction in which these companions were. To approach any nearer over the grass without being seen was not possible. To re-enter the forest and work down from above would not have been difficult, but would have defeated my purpose, for the wind was blowing down the hill. There remained the alternative of re-entering the forest and skirting round the lower end of the grass slope, but this would take time and entail a stiff climb. I therefore finally decided to remain where I was and see if these deer, which I was seeing for the first time, would react in the same way as Cheetal and Sambar do to the call of a leopard, of which I knew there was at least one on the mountain, for I had seen its scratch marks earlier in the day. With only one eye showing, I waited until the hind was cropping the grass, and then gave the call of a leopard. At the first sound of my voice, the hind swung round and, facing me, started to strike the ground with her forefeet. This was a warning to her companions to be on the alert, but those companions whom I wanted to see would not move until the hind called, and this she would not do until she saw the leopard. I was wearing a brown tweed coat, and projecting a few inches of my left shoulder beyond the rock I moved it up and down. The movement was immediately detected by the hind who, taking a few quick steps forward, started to call. The danger she had warned her companions of was in sight, and it was now safe for them to join her. The first to come was a yearling, which, stepping daintily over the hail-covered ground, ranged itself alongside the hind. The yearling was followed by three stags, who in turn were followed by an old hind. The entire herd, numbering six in all, were now in full view at a range of 35 yards. The hind was still calling, while the others, with ears alternately held rigid or feeling forward and backward for sound and wind direction, were standing perfectly still and gazing into the forest behind me. My seat on the melting hail was uncomfortable and wet, and to remain inactive longer would possibly result in a cold. I had seen a representative herd of the much-famed Kashmir deer, and I had heard a hind call, but there was one thing more that I wanted. That was, to hear a stag call so I again projected a few inches of my shoulder beyond the rock, and had the satisfaction of hearing the stags, the hinds, and the yearling calling in different pitched keys. My pass permitted me to shoot one stag, and for all I knew one of the stags might have carried a record head, 
but though I had set out that morning to look for a stag, and procure meat for the camp, I now realized that I was in no urgent need of a trophy. In any case, the stag's meat would probably be tough so, instead of using the rifle, I stood up, and six of the most surprised deer in Kashmir vanished out of sight, and a moment later I heard them crashing through the undergrowth on the far side of the knoll. It was now time for me to retrace my steps to the bungalow, and I decided to go down the grassy slope and work through the lighter forest at the foot of the mountain. The slope was at an angle that lent itself to an easy lope, provided care was taken to see that every step was correctly placed. I was running in the middle of the hundred yard open ground and had gone about 600 yards when I caught sight of a white object, standing on a rock at the edge of the forest on the left hand side of the slope, and about 300 yards below me. A hurried glance convinced me that the white object was a goat, that had probably been lost in the forest. We had been without meat for a fortnight and I had promised Fortescue that I would bring something back with me, and there was my opportunity. The goat had seen me, and if I could disarm suspicion would possibly let me pass close enough to catch it by the legs, so as I loped along I edged to the left, keeping the animal in sight out of the corner of my eyes. Provided the animal stayed where it was, no better place on all the mountain could have been found on which to catch it, for the flat rock, at the very edge of which it was standing, jutted out into the slope, and was about five feet high. Without looking directly at it, and keeping up a steady pace, I ran past the rock and, as I did so, made a sweep with my left hand for its forelegs. With a sneeze of alarm the animal reared up, avoiding my grasp, and when I pulled up clear of the rock and turned round, I saw to my amazement that the animal I had mistaken for a white goat was an albino musk deer. With only some ten feet between us the game little animal was standing its ground and sneezing defiance at me. Turning away I walked down the hill for fifty yards, and when I looked back, the deer was still standing on the rock, possibly congratulating itself on having frightened me away. When some weeks later I related the occurrence to the game warden of Kashmir, he expressed great regret at my not having shot the deer, and was very anxious to know the exact locality in which I had seen it, but as my memory for places, and my description of localities, is regrettably faulty, I do not think that particular albino musk deer is gracing any museum. Male leopards are very resentful of intrusion of others of their kind in the area they consider to be their own. True, the Manita's territory extended over an area of 500 square miles in which there were possibly many other male leopards, still, he had been in this particular area for several weeks, and might very reasonably consider it his own. And again, the mating season was only just over, and the leopard might mistake my call for the call of a female in search of a mate, so waiting until it was quite dark I called and, to my surprise and delight, was immediately answered by a leopard some 400 yards below and a little to the right. The ground between us was strewn with great rocks and overgrown with matted thorn bushes, and I knew the leopard would not come in a straight line towards me, and that he would probably skirt round the broken ground and come up a subsidiary ridge to the one my tree was on. This I found, when next he called, that he was doing. Five minutes later I located his call as coming from the path that, starting from my tree, ran across the face of the hill, about 200 yards away. This call I answered, to give the leopard direction. Three, or it may have been four, minutes later, he called again from a distance of a hundred yards. It was a dark night and I had an electric torch lashed to the side of my rifle, and my thumb on the push button. From the root of the tree the path ran in a straight line for 50 yards, to where there was a sharp bend in it. It would not be possible for me to know when or where to direct the beam of the torch on this part of the path, so I should have to wait until the leopard was on the goat. Just beyond the bend, and only 60 yards away, the leopard again called, and was answered by another leopard far up the mountainside. A complication as unexpected as it was unfortunate, for my leopard was too close now for me to call and as he had last heard me from a distance of 200 yards he would naturally assume that the coy female had removed herself farther up the hill and was calling to him to join her there. There was, however, just a possibility of his continuing along the path to its junction with the path coming down the hill, in which case he would be sure to kill the goat, even if he had no use for it. But the goat's luck was in, and mine out, for the leopard cut across the angle formed by the two paths, and the next time he called he was a hundred yards farther from me, and a hundred yards nearer his prospective coaxing mate. The calling of the two leopards drew nearer and nearer together, and finally stopped. 
After a long period of silence the caterwauling of these two giant cats came floating down to me from where I judged the grassland ended and the dense forest began. The leopard's luck was unfortunately in, in more ways than one, not least of all because it was dark, for leopards when courting are very easy to shoot. The same can be said of tigers, but the sportsman who goes on foot to look for courting tigers should be quite sure that he wants to see them, for a tigress, never a tiger, is very sensitive at these times, and quite understandably so, for males of the cat tribe are rough in their courting, and do not know how sharp their claws are. The leopard had not died, nor would he die that night, but maybe he would die the next day, or the day after, for his sands were running out, and so for a long moment I thought were mine, for without any warning a sudden blast of wind struck the tree, and my heels and my head changed their relative position with the land of Garwal. For seconds I thought it impossible for the tree to regain its upright position, or for me to retain contact with it. When the pressure eased, the tree and I got back to where we were before the wind struck us, and fearing that worse might follow, I hurriedly tied the rifle to a branch, to have the use of both hands. The pine had possibly withstood many wind storms equally bad, if not worse, but never with a human being on it to add weight and increase wind pressure. When the rifle was safe, I climbed out onto one branch after another, and broke off all the tassels of pine needles that I could reach. It may only have been my imagination, but after I had lightened the tree it did not appear to heal over as dangerously as it had at first done. Fortunately the pine was comparatively young and supple, and its roots firm set, for it was tossed about like a blade of grass for an hour and then, as suddenly as it had started, the wind died down. There was no possibility of the leopard returning, so, after I had smoked a cigarette, I followed the goat into the land of dreams. As the sun was rising a cooey brought me back to within 50 feet of earth, and under the tree were my two companions of the previous evening, reinforced by two youths from their village. When they saw that I was awake, they asked whether I had heard the leopards during the night, and what had happened to the tree, and were hugely amused when I told them I had had a friendly conversation with the leopards, and that having nothing else to do I had amused myself by breaking the branches of the tree. I then asked them if by chance they had noticed that there had been some little wind during the night, on which one of the youths answered, a little wind, Sahib. Such a big wind has never been known, and it has blown away my hut. To which his companion rejoined, that is no matter for regret, Sahib, for sure Singh has long been threatening to rebuild his hut, and the wind has saved him the trouble of dismantling the old one. To be continued.